Chapter 67 Predestination and Grace John chapter 21, verses 18 to 25 Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdedest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This speak he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will not eat tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that this disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, Ye shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? This is the disciple which testifieth with these things, and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. John chapter 21, verses 18 to 25. The conclusion to John's Gospel has not been justly expounded. It is a rather startling one. In verse 18, our Lord tells Peter, When you were young, you did very much as you pleased. But in your old age, others will do with you what they will. There is a suggestion in Jesus' words of death, of execution at the hands of others. Peter certainly understood that some kind of arrest and execution was meant. This clearly came as a jolt to Peter. He looked at John and then asked Jesus about John's future. What about this man? Jesus' answer was very blunt. If I will not he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Verse 22. Very obviously, our Lord's words presuppose predestination. It is he who ordains the lives of all men, and he has decreed the lives and deaths of his disciples. His statement is emphatic. If I will. All depends on his sovereign will. Neither Peter nor any other disciple disputes this. His predestinational purpose differs from one person to another, so that no equality exists in his predestination. He could decree that John remain alive until the second coming, although he does not do so. His remark was construed by some as exempting John from death, a foolish misinterpretation. What he did say was that his will is sovereign, so that no man can complain about his potion. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, For who maketh thee to differ from another, and what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thy glory as if thou hadst not received it? What we are is as much a part of God's predestinating power as is what shall become of us later in time and in eternity. Hence our Lord's blunt statement, What is that to thee? God's purposes for us are determined by Him, not by us. But this does not absolve us from our duty. Predestination does not mean that we are automatons. We are responsible creatures with a secondary responsibility and freedom. Therefore, our Lord tells Peter, Follow thou me. This Peter can do, as can we. In the Greek, the order of the words is, Thou, follow me. It is personal and intensive. We are not to look at God's treatment of others and then envy their blessings. We are all called to serve in a particular sphere and way, and we are also being prepared for our eternal calling. But this is a problem, because ours is an age that stresses equality. Although we may be fully aware of the evils of equalitarianism, we are still so much the children of our times that we hunger for a levelling that will favour us. This tacit equalitarianism is anti-Christian. Our urge to say, Why me, Lord? is wrong. 
Again, without predestination, there is no grace. Predestination and grace are simply different aspects of God's sovereignty. If we remove God's election from the scene, we then have man's self-electing words, and no gospel at all. John, throughout his gospel, stresses God's sovereignty and predestination. At the conclusion, he records that Jesus confronted the disciples with this fact. What he said to Peter applied to all. John might not die in the hands of executioners, but his sufferings were no less than Peter's. The Isle of Patmos, Revelation chapter 1 verse 9, where he was held a prisoner, was a particularly brutal slave labour site, which few survived. Every disciple was to be used by men, exactly as God ordained, because all were Christ's witnesses. In verses 24 and 25, John tells us that his account is attested as true. Again, as in John chapter 20, verse 30, John tells us that more books could be written about Jesus than the world could contain. Certainly, if a daily journal had been kept by the disciples, we would have several large volumes of detailed accounts. But this does not seem to be what John meant. What his language in chapter 20, verse 30, and chapter 21, verse 25 tells us is that fully to describe the account for Jesus Christ is impossible. As the Word of God, God the Son, He is, like a Father and the Spirit, inexhaustible. Fully to describe a man would be difficult, but because man is a creature and limited, theoretically it can be done. Not so with God. How can one describe or comprehend one who is eternal, infinite and invisible, as well as almighty, all-wise, most holy, most absolute, and most free in all his being? To comprehend God would require of us a mind equal to God. Although he is incomprehensible, we can still know him truly through his revelation, because he is totally self-consistent in all his being. It is this that John refers to, and that all his gospel is about. Since John wrote his gospel, the number of commentaries on the life of Jesus Christ, studies in the gospels, theological works on the subject, and more have been legion. Yet each generation sees afresh his total relevance, and no generation can exhaust his meaning. John writes, Orthodox Christians have always held, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit in a unique way. As in all scripture, in John we see the words which are God-given. In John, more than in Matthew, Mark and Luke, the deity of Jesus Christ is dealt with most plainly, but John's final word is that the subject is, like the person, inexhaustible. But John, in his prologue, gives us a summation, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 8, which rings out like music. John Calvin once wrote of the Apostles' Creed that it should be sung, because it is glorious music. There is another curious fact about John's ending. Mark and Luke conclude with Christ's ascension. Matthew tells us that the disciples assembled at the Mount of Ascension, and although he concludes his account with the Great Commission, the ascension is implicit. John does not include the ascension. He tells us of our Lord's many references to it, but it is not recorded. His account of Jesus Christ presents him as forever present and yet eternally on the throne of glory. Twice John tells us that much remains untold about the signs Jesus did in the presence of his disciples. John chapter 20 verse 30 following, chapter 21 verse 24 following. Why did John not make such a statement earlier in his gospel? Why at the end, in connection with the account of the resurrection, and his appearances thereafter. The signs are miracles with a meaning that reveals the gospel. Nothing more clearly reveals the gospel than Christ's atoning death and his resurrection. They tell us that Jesus Christ has destroyed the power of sin and death. John, therefore, deliberately limits the number of miracles he reports in order to point to and concentrate on our Lord's death and resurrection. The Jesus of history is he who made atonement for us, died, and was resurrected. His life cannot be understood apart from this, nor can we know his history in any other light. This is why John's 
testimony is true. And while books filling the earth could not contain all that could be said, the testimony given by John is faithful. This has been a Calcedon Foundation production, produced by Grace Community School and Nicene Covenant Church, published by Ross House Books. Copyright 2000, Mark R. Rushduni. If you enjoyed this audiobook, be sure to visit calcedon.edu for more books and audiobooks by R.J. Rushduni.